With this, that prompts me to ask the question, are there professors of economics in Africa? Of course, it should be the political leaders that should evolve policies about these issues. The question, however, is, if the political actors do not see this hemorrhage, why should the academicians not see it? Are they not supposed to scan the global system so as to, as to what is going on, where and why? Are professors and academicians not supposed to use their knowledge to see what is good or bad for their people? It is a tragedy, I'm telling you. Here in Uganda, we have had to fight the neo-colonial politicians, civil servants, parasitic importing merchants on account of this hemorrhage. Omurumogwa Africa, kusaka. Buliki nitichi onacha kusaka. Entebe za kusaka. Entebe zo kutura ko. Bagane ni basaka entebe Dubai. Dubai edunge liyo msenyu. Liko le entebe. Fiwa abali mchibira wano. Jetu saka. Through. So we have been through struggle. We have caused the vertical integration in some sectors outlined below. Because when we came from the bush, we were clear, we told you, point number five, build an economy which is independent, integrated, and self-sustaining, exactly solving this problem. But war here within Uganda, opposed by external forces and by internal groups. But still we have moved. Museven ensures the issue of patriotism and pan-Africanism. Whenever he is addressing the public, he always talks about pan-African and being patriotic to your country. He says the only way for Africa to develop is to stop depending on others. Why? Because Africa is gifted with good soil, mineral, the climate is so good. But why is Africa underdeveloping? So he says the issue of dependency still eat up Africa. And for it to grow, we must create or we must develop independence in us. First of all, they oppose our value addition efforts so as to frustrate our industrialization efforts. Secondly, they are always importing everything from outside, including trivialities like dead people's hair. It is, it is these processes that have stunted Africa's growth. It is a scandal if there were people to recognize real scandals. You hear people talking of scandals, but they are talking about small scandals. This is a mega centuries old scandal, which I don't hear anybody talking about, many people talking about. The global value for trade in coffee is US dollars 460 billion. The coffee growing countries of the whole world get only 25 billion US dollars. And wonderful Africa gets only 2.5 billion dollars from a figure of 460 billion dollars. This is coffee. And, and much of this 2.5 billion dollars, which is coming to Africa because of coffee, is now going to Uganda, because Uganda is, is taking 800 million dollars of that. 
although we are producing a lot of coffee, 8 million birds, but you, you hear we are still getting only 800 million dollars out of the 2.5 billion that Africa shares from a figure of 460 billion. Uh -huh. So you are getting very little money from coffee. How about automobiles, vehicles? The global automobile business is US dollars 2.86 trillion of Tabarika. Of Tabarika, Bubiri, Kumpibu Satu. Africa's share in the manufacture of vehicles is only 30 billion dollars out of 2.86 trillion. And I think this goes to maybe South Africa or something like that. The global pharmaceutical business is US dollars 1.42 trillion. Africa's share is US dollars 16 billion. The global business for furniture, furniture, and tables of Tula Co. Oh, banana. Is US dollars 654 billion. Abazunguban, Batunyaga, Emiaka, Ejise, Never to live into the affair. Badja, Never to our Yaulam, Never to live into the affair, we over Gabby Never to our dinner. Kwanga Africa, a navy of Gagabinji. Nay, no way back in the Vasca of a chat to New Newta. Gabaleta would division among us, never treated Okuber and Gatuluana. Gain over Twala, a bean to be a fee. So Agamba, Okulabanga, Africa, Damokuveda great again is to make sure that we unite for a common good. We unite. For a common cause, to like that, we are not to depend on the So watch this address when Uganda was marking 60 years of independence. That, however, would not be free of problems of of discordance. You have seen Britain walking out of, of that body, and you have seen the tensions with Hungary, Serbia, etc. Hence, the best formula, if possible, so as to create a framework for guaranteeing prosperity of people, is the USA formula, which entails both political and economic integration. Here in Africa, it points to the, cre the creation of the political federations, like the ones of East Africa. Such a federation would not only guarantee the prosperity of the people through a big market that would it would also guarantee that would guarantee offtake for producers of goods and services but it would also ensure strategic security of people nobody could dare to threaten their security they would ensure their four dimensional strategic security on land in the air at sea and in space. It would also deal with the problem of the suppressed fraternity of the African peoples. The 54 countries of Africa created by colonialism do not pay atten the slightest attention to the four linguistic groups of Africa. The four are the Niger Congo, the Nairo Saharan, the Afro-Asiatic and the Khoisan. These are the four clusters of nations based on language. Obviously, the 54 countries do not pay attention to this. Hence, here in East Africa, you find the interlocutions the Bantus of this area are scattered in Uganda, Congo, Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania, and Kenya. Yet, these are peoples whose dialects are mutually intelligible. Some months ago, at Munyonyo, I found a group 
of young people seated. When I engaged them, I found they were Kenyans. Of course, it is not easy, it is not easy to know who is a Kenyan and who is a Ugandan by looking at them. You have to ask them. I then asked one of them, a girl, what her name was. Her answer was Kwambuka. Her name was Kwambuka. Eh? Kwambuka. Where do you come from? Was my next question. Her answer, Kisi. Kisi in Kenya, the, the land of, of His Excellency, Dr. Ruto. Then my next, my next question was, what does Kwambuka mean in Kisi? I asked the young lady. The answer, it means crossing a river or a valley. The young lady answered. That is exactly what it means in the, in the Runyakitara dialects. You can't believe it. It is not only the interaction Bantu that are fragmented in these countries. How about our laws in South Sudan, Congo, Uganda, Kenya, Ethiopia, and Tanzania? The Kalenjin, Uganda, South Sudan, and Kenya. And the Ateke, South Sudan, Congo, Uganda, Kenya, Ethiopia, and Tanzania. When you talk of the law, law you are talking of the Alurs, Achoris, Langis, Japadola, Ruos, Anyuak in Ethiopia, Kumam. When you talk of the Kalenjin, you are talking of the Sabini, Pokot, Nandis, Kipsigi, CTC. When you talk of the Ateke, you are talking of the Kakwas, the Bari, the Topotha, the Turkana, the Karamojong, the Itoset, ETC. Where do the Maasai belong? Are they Ateke or Kalenjin? Help the author, please. However, I know that they are certainly Nairo Hamitic. In the case of East Africa, we have the added value, added bonus <coughs> in the form of the fraternity of the Swahili language speakers. It has therefore been long ever since the NRM and its precursors started supporting the struggle for the realization of the dream of the East African Federation. If we had achieved that by 1963, as the elders had, had intended, this part of the world would be very far. Some of the political elite let down Africa in 1963 by frustrating that effort. If that federation had been launched in 1963, you can be sure that Idi Amin would never have taken power in Uganda. There would have been no genocide in Rwanda or the killings in Burundi. Congo would have stabilized long ago. The problems of South Sudan would have been solved much earlier, and the problem of Somalia may not have turned out the way it did. Even today, the sort of problems we are facing would be easily solved. Take the problem, and I'm glad His Excellency Ruto spoke on this. Take the problem of high food prices, for instance. A few years ago, Uganda produced 5 million tons of maize. Uganda consumed only 1 million tons because Ugandans have other foods. It is only institutions and the animal feeds manufacturers that use maize. There was therefore a surplus of 4 million tons, which had no market in East Africa on account of the non-tariff barriers, protectionism. The prices collapsed and the farmers in Uganda walked away from growing maize. Only now, to be told, that there is a big demand for maize and even people are dying. The store of maize is the same as the store of milk, sugar, rice. Some Ugandans wanted me to stop Tanzanian rice. Please, I would not do that. If the Tanzanians are growing rice more cheaply, let them grow it and you buy from them. And if you want, you, you, can, you can apply and you shift and go and, and, and uh, ask the Tanzanian government to allow you to do rice in Tanzania. In my opinion, East Africans would be better off if the most efficient East African producers 
are encouraged so that the whole of the region benefits. Recently, I was told of some attempts to block uh, rice from Tanzania in order to protect the inefficient rice growers of Uganda. I could not accept such blindness. Why, first of all, punish Ugandans to consume expensive rice while Tanzanian brothers can produce cheaper rice? The other blindness is that you should remember that if you block Tanzanian rice, Tanzania will also block something else from Uganda. Where then is the future of prosperity for our region? Why block East African products and open our markets for subsidized goods from Europe, China, Brazil, ETC? Those should be the ones to be blocked because they are, they are unfairly selling in our market. Foreign governments subsidize goods versus our unsubsidized goods. If you allow subsidized Brazilian products to kill the market for Uganda's sugar in East Africa, what return benefit will East Africa get from Brazil? What does Brazil give you in return? East Africa is a potential superpower of the League, of India, or China. If we integrate economically and politically, assisted fortunately by the Swahili language, which is part of the heritage of this area. If our economics professors wake up and see the hemorrhage the NRM revolutionaries have been seeing ever since the 1960s on account of only producing raw materials, and the political class determines not to build a Latin America in Africa, but instead build a United States of Africa in Africa, a very prosperous and secure future for Africa will be ensured. In spite of the missed opportunities in the East African region, and in spite of so many avoidable mistakes that were committed by different actors, Uganda finally stabilized and started not only growing, but also undergoing social economic transformation ever since 1986. The small independence enclave of colonial economy of 1962, of the three C's and three T's, had by 1986 shrunk by 25 percent. The three C's were co coffee, cotton, and copper, and the three T's were tobacco, tea, and tourism. By 1986, all the three C's had disappeared except coffee that was still limping on. All the three T's had disappeared except tobacco, which was still limping on. Having lost 24 years, because you are talking of 60 years, actually you should be talking of 36 years. Because 60, 24 of the 60 years, we, we are lost. Having lost 24 years of the 60 years, the NRM, our movement, had fortunately had many years of clarifying our ideological, philosophical, and strategic position on almost all issues of society and the economy. We had already distilled our four principles of patriotism, pan-Africanism, social economic transformation, and democracy. To realize the four principles, we put forward the 10 points program, out of which point number five was the one guiding us to build an integrated, independent, and self-sustaining national economy that rejected the slave roar of 10 million acres were used for intensive agriculture of the four acres model. That would give us 2.5 million small farms. In the Ruenga area, our small scale farmers using only one acre are employing 15 people per farm. Using this conservative figure, the 2.5 million small farms would employ 37.5 million people. Assuming the other 5 million acres were for medium-scale farming, using farms of 100 acres each, we should have 50,000 farms. These, in addition to the intensive agriculture activities of the small farms, would use extensive agriculture to produce maize, sugarcane, cotton, tea, tobacco, etc., 
products that only make economic sense when they are produced on a large scale. These would create their own jobs. All, is just, all this is just in agriculture. How about industry, manufacturing? How about services? How about ICT? The problem, therefore, is not jobs. The problem is the neo-colonial thinking that is always off the point and not able to understand the strong potential of Africa. Now that we have solved the problem of electricity, we are moving full steam on all the opportunities of the value addition in agro-processing, fruit processing, animal feeds for maize, cassava flour and starch, banana flour and starch, ethanol from different sources, ETC, paper from forest products, sealing boards from foreign, for, forest products, vertical integrated steel industry, food processing of copper, fertilizer industry from our phosphates, the pathogenic in the economy of vaccines and pharmaceuticals, and uh, the diagnostics and sanitizers, and the knowledge industry of automobiles and electronics, as you saw here, th these which are already being made here. With our East African brothers and sisters, the sky is the limit. Recently, I'm about to finish. Munange Miyake Nkaga, 60 years, please, Muzikirze, allow me. Munikubari Miyaka Sitini, Sio Kituraisi, Recently, there was yet another manifestation of imperialistic arrogance and hegemonism by elements in the European Parliament, whereby they decreed from Brussels that East African crude pipeline should not be constructed until those arrogant actors permit us to do so. Parasitic elements from that part of the world have been causing problems for Africa and the world for the last 500 years. It all started with 1453 AD when the Turkish Ottomans captured Constantinople and blocked the land route for Europe to the east for trade in silk spices ETC. The Europeans led by Portugal legitimately started looking for an alternative sea route to the east to outflank, to outflank the, to the, the blockade. Partly due to our internal weaknesses caused by the bankrupt tribal chiefs, what started as a search for alternative route to the east soon became a mega slave trading phenomenon, colonialism, exploitation, looting, and genocide in Africa, Asia, and the Americas. By 1900, the whole of Africa had been colonized except for Ethiopia. However, soon the Africans and other colonized peoples reorganized and launched a massive anti-colonial movement in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the struggle for equal rights by the black nation in the USA. The African National Congress was founded in South Africa in 1912. By 1994, the arrogant imperialists were defeated in South Africa. Earlier on, the colonized peoples had achieved victories in Indonesia, India, Indochina, Mozambique, Kenya, Algeria, Angola, Guinea-Bissau, Zimbabwe, Namibia, and the whole of Africa, either through armed struggle or through peaceful mass struggle. 1994, with the liberation of South Africa, should have marked the end of imperialist arrogance and meddling in the, in the affairs of their former victims. However, some elements are incorrigible, as you can see from this resolution. The patriotic forces in the world are, however, much stronger and the patriotic forces in Uganda are much stronger and very capable in all dimensions. The imperialists use the mistakes and the weakness of Africa 
Otherwise, Africa is invincible, as was shown by the victories in Mozambique, Angola, and Zimbabwe. East Africans, therefore, should not worry about those arrogant people, th that those arrogant people can stop the oil project in East Africa. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe, like, and share.